Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Let's give this uh, just a minute or so for everybody to get into the meeting. All right, looks like everything's all up and running. We're live on Facebook Live, also on Zoom here. Well, welcome to our uh, Thursday program. This is our advanced AF5000 virtual booth visit. Uh, as you know, there's no air shows. They've all been canceled, including Oshkosh this year. And so instead of that, we've got a week of live events. We've done a couple so far. Today is an uh, advanced date. Uh, right now, it's the AF5000 virtual booth visit. At 4 p.m. today, we'll be doing uh, a seminar on advanced panel from advanced flight systems. And then tomorrow, we're doing a similar thing with uh, Dynon Skyview. And then on Saturday, we're having a, a virtual hangar happy hour will be a little less uh, formal and a little less structured than these events. So what we're doing today here is uh, you know, the AF5000 is the flagship EFIS system um, from Advanced Flight Systems. And in today's visit, we'll show you the reasons you should choose AF5000, preview some of the new features coming to uh, the upcoming version 16 software, and we'll take your questions. And uh, the way this works, uh, if you haven't been to one of these before, is that you're all muted, um, uh, so only, only we can talk usually. And if you want to ask a question, there is a chat button in, the, in Zoom, and you can type out questions there. And we have uh, a few people from Advanced, uh, Ken, Sean, Jeffrey, that are staffing the Zoom uh, that will answer questions there. Uh, and also, we'll periodically stop for, for questions. And then you can raise your hand, and you can do that under the, uh, if you're on a computer, on Zoom, it's under the participants button. You can raise your hand there, and uh, then we'll ask you to unmute your microphone, and then you can talk to us. Uh, and similarly, on Facebook Live, there's no way for you to talk to us, but there is, should, there is a chat feed uh, below the video or alongside the video, depending on what platform you're on. You could type out a question there, and one of our colleagues from Advanced will be able to field that question. Uh, let's see. So today presenting is Rob Hickman. He's the founder and president of Advanced Flight Systems. Uh, you know, one of the cool things about him is that he is uh, the, uh, I think it's a 2017 inductee into the EA Hall of Fame for home building. Uh, he, won't, he won't say that himself, so I get to, to brag on him for, for a bit. And uh, he's going to tell you all about the Advanced AF5000 series. So go ahead, take it away, Rob. So I, with us today also we have Ken, our head software engineer, Sean, our software engineer, and Jeffrey, and who else is with us here? Got, got two screens here. Looks Nick, like Nick. Looks oh, like Nick's, Nick's here. here too. So that's our main software team. So they really have put all the work into this. I just test it and come up with ideas. They do all the work. So. Um, we have been working on a new version of software, our version 16 software for about a year and a half or more. Um, it is pretty much ready for release and we actually have beta release and a lot of people in this room are actually already flying it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go over it and we'll talk about each of the new features. Um, we've gone to a new screen layout. If you notice all of the menu items on the side and the buttons are now dark black and gray instead of blue. So it's got a new look. Um, the labeling for all of them, as you can see, they're like CDI, bearing, waypoint ID. Anything that's GPS derived is magenta now to make it clearer. We've gone to white text for the actual values. The airspeed and altitude tapes are larger fonts, clearer, and we've also gotten rid of the leading zeros on them. We, uh, the roll scale pointer is also much larger. The roll scale itself has got a black outline. It's larger. We got a lot of input from Vans aircraft doing flight testing that um, they wanted to see a larger roll scale pointer. So we've done that. So we added that. We'll go to our next screen, figure out how to run this. So AHAR selection, we kind of reworked a lot of the menus. So the menus slide in and out from the side. This is by touching the center of the screen or the uh, airplane icon in the middle, 
uh, that's how you bring up this menu. This is where you can select AHARSs. Now we actually, each screen, depending on how many AHARSs are in the system, in this case, this is out of my RV10, we, I have three AHARSs swept to the screen. There's two Dynon AHARSs, AHARS1, AHARS2, and then I have a backup G5 EFIS that also it will use for cross comparison, and you can also select it as the AHARS source. And we've color coded it so you can actually see what it's doing. If you notice here, the airplane pointers and the horizon pointers are white on the top. The lower color depicts what AHARS it's using. So light, light gray is AHARS1, dark gray is AHARS2, and in this case, AHARS3, which is the backup G5, is orange. So we want something that kind of stood out more if you were on the emergency AHARS. And actually, when you switch, it brings up a warning. You can see this one says, using AHARS3 remote Garmin G5. The way to fly that most of the time is keep it in auto. In auto mode, it will automatically switch if one fails. And it starts with AHARS1, AHARS2, and then the backup AHARS. This menu is also where you can bring up things like the timers, the minimum altitudes, you can reset the G-meter, um, you can quickly select where you want the course needle. So if you want a GNAV1, which stands for GPS navigator, or the bearing needle. So touching the middle of the screen brings it up. You notice there's also in, an inset window. We have two inset windows, and if you touch them, it'll actually let you bring up an in, a small inset window on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. There we have a lot of different options we'll show later, but you can bring up a G-meter, a mini map, a mini flight plan, traffic window, any of that type of stuff. This here shows how we're on AHARS 2. Notice it's dark gray on the airplane icons in the middle there. This is the new autopilot menu. It, um, with it, we have an improved, uh, Dynon's been working on the autopilot algorithm and we have integrated it into this. So we, the autopilot, you should see a noticeable difference in how well it flies the aircraft. It does better at altitude hold and on approaches. So some of you may have noticed with the old version of 15 software, you'd be off a dot or a quarter dot on an ILS or LPV approach. That should all be gone and fixed now. It's much better performance. And we have quite a few new gain settings you can do too. Notice this is, um, this looks exactly like the Dynon AP panel. Uh, it does have the little green indicators tell you which mode is actually enabled right now. So in this case, the autopilot is on because it's green. And you can bring this up by touching the autopilot where it says APYD in the middle of the screen here. That brings up the autopilot menu. Anything you can do with touch, you can also do with side buttons that are there. The flight director right now, the FD, that's how you would turn on and off the flight director. Notice it's black right now. If you touch that, it would bring up the flight director and it would put a green bar over it. So in this mode, the lateral is in track, the vertical is in vertical speed, and we're in vertical flight plan mode. So we can kind of go over any of those. There's heading mode. In heading mode, the aircraft actually follows the magnetic heading of the aircraft. Um, if you're following ATC instruction, they're giving you heading. That's where you should be. Track mode, like this one is in, is it looks at GPS ground track. I fly my RV-10 usually in ground track. And notice the heading bug right now is teal. The teal means it's in um, track mode. If it was in heading mode, it would be yellow. Uh, nav. If you wanted to actually follow the flight plan, you would touch nav and it, what it does is it turns a yellow, the bar would become yellow when it's armed. When you're actually coupled and it's following the flight plan, it would turn to green. It would switch from track to green. Track would turn black, nav would turn green. Um, vertical speed means you would actually climb at the, whatever vertical speed you have it set at. Those are those two teal bar, uh, teal indicators, bugs to the right of the altitude tape. There's two modes to fly vertical speed uh, or climbing with the autopilot. Vertical speed or indicated airspeed. So you can also fly a certain, like you wanna climb at 125 knots, you'd go to indicated airspeed, climb and descent. Um, VNAV is where you arm it to fly an approach. So 
most of the time I leave my plane with a yellow VNAV arm. That way, when your GPS navigator comes up on an ILS or an LPV approach, it would turn green, capture, and fly the approach. Uh, we probably, should we stop and ask any questions or Ken, you wanna have any input? This is, people have lots of questions always about our autopilot modes. Yeah, if there's anybody that has a question, um, you can raise your hand again in Zoom uh, or type in the chat, or if you're on Facebook Live, there's a chat window there where we could field questions. If you raise your hand, we can uh, get to you live as well. One thing that's different about the AFS EFIS is the altitude mode of the autopilot is live all the time. So it's following the altitude bug. You don't have to pick away how you're going to get there. So right now we're at 10,500. If we moved it to 11,000, the, the airplane would climb to 11,000 immediately. That's yeah, a lot, of, a lot of systems you actually have to, you know, when you adjust the altitude bug or something like that, you actually have to tell it to go. But our system, we found our customers really like the fact that it's always engaged. So it, it just follows the bug anytime the autopilot's on. There's also a 180 button there that uh, just basically just turns you around, puts it in, uh, I believe, track mode and, and flips you around 180. So if you ever get in a bad situation, you can hit the 180 button and it'll just fly you right back out. And level button too. Right. So the level button always levels the wings first and then levels the pitch after the wings are level. It goes to ver zero vertical speed. All right, any questions? So the other thing we've added by popular demand is a dual queue flight director. So we have a single queue inverted V-bar or a dual queue. This is the dual queue flight director. Um, you can switch back and forth in flight. You just hit set autopilot, isn't it again? Set EFIS flight director. Set, okay, there you go. Yeah. Here, I'm gonna change my screen to here. So yeah, like he was saying, you could hit set EFIS and flight director and change your, your style. And then the on off is under EFIS flight director. So here, here it's on, so I can go back to set EFIS and change it between dual and uh, command bars. All right. There's a good question in, um, in the chat, which I think Jeffrey already answered, but uh, I'll, I'll just ask it out loud for everyone. If I fly in VNAV mode climbing and get too high, airspeed drops off, does your system account for that, uh, the potential stall somehow, or have AOA limits? I can answer or can, yes. So it has a minimum airspeed, the autopilot has minimum airspeed, so it should not stall the airplane. It, um, it looks at two things, it looks at airspeed, and then it, it won't stall the plane, it also won't overspeed the plane. So if you're descending too quick, it'll actually pull back on it and slow down. It'll also respect the bank angle limits you set and uh, their G limitations as well. Correct. So one thing, um, we have a lot of systems that use the PS Engineering remote audio panel. And in the past, you always had to bring up the audio panel page to change radios, which radio was transmitting, which page radio was receiving. So in this at the upper left-hand corner, kind of in the middle there where it says audio, you can see right now we're transmitting on COM1 and we're listening on COM1 and COM2. So people wanted a way of switching radios without having to bring up the whole audio panel. So now if you just touch the transmit button, it'll switch transmitters to COM2. If you touch the receive button on the side, it'll actually, in this mode, quit listening to COM2, and you can flip-flop. So you can actually select radios without having to bring up the audio panel page. Selecting the middle of the button brings up the audio panel page now. And we'll go ahead and go to that. So this is the PS Engineering audio panel page. We've kind of added their logo to it. Um, we have lots of questions. The, this little battery icon, it has Bluetooth and it actually hooks to your phone or iPad. So that is actually your battery level in your phone or iPad that's connected to it. And so this is the different modes in here. So the mute, that is how the music mutes. Um, none means it, um, nothing mutes the music. It's karaoke mode, they call it. 
Um, radio only, if you had it in that mode, uh, every time the radio transmits or receives, it would mute it, or all talking in the plane or radio would mute it. The next two buttons in the middle are NAV1 and NAV2. That's where you can actually listen to and decode the NAV. Um, I have an IFD 550 in my plane that decodes the NAV frequency, so I find I almost never use those. ICS is intercom select mode. There's isolate um, or isolate mode. So I'm in all mode. All means you can hear everybody. Crew is the front passengers only. Isolate is just the pilot. So that's your, if you get tired of hearing everybody in the back seat, you can select it there. Uh, intercom volume is adjusted here. So I'm at 40%. And then the music volume coming in is the next selection down below that. Uh, below that is where you actually select the music source. So you can have Bluetooth music. There's two different wired inputs if you have them hooked up. So you can select each pilot, co-pilot, and passengers, what's the source of the music. And you can actually have three different sources for each person. Below that, it shows where the uh, receiver selects. So these are the comm radio. So right now we're receiving on comm one, transmitting on comm one. And it works just like the main menu at the beginning there or split mode. In split mode, if you press that, the pilot's on COM1, the co-pilot's on COM2. Do you and with have any the other? With the Bluetooth, you also, if you have it hooked to your phone, it does caller ID and tells you oh. who's calling so you can talk, to your, talk through your uh, headset through your phone via the, using the audio panel. Yeah, if the phone rings, it brings up a, on our info strip, it actually brings up the phone number and who's calling. So that's kind of a neat feature. And this is the P, using the PDA 360R. Uh, there's a remote version of it that talks to the screen, and then there's also a panel-mounted version that talks, and can you can do it from the panel. Did we skip a slide? Why did we skip the slide? So on this page, this brings up our radio page. So touching the radio, so if you go back a slide, you can see the radio right now is in 128.15. Um, that's the active, it's in green, standby is in teal. If you touch that, it brings up the radio page. This is where you can flip flop the radio, uh, select what airport you wanna listen to. It acts exactly like the Dynon remote uh, comm head, SV comm. You can hit tower and it'll bring up the tower frequency list, ground, it'll bring up the ground frequency. And if there's, so if there's multiple frequencies, it actually will show them. Uh, you can actually type in a frequency. So if they all start with one. So the one and it's intelligent and it highlights the, the frequencies left. Um, this works with the Dynon Com. You, if you have it hooked to an Avidine IFD, you can tune and control the radio in Avidine. Uh, GTR 200, SL30, SL40, 255, any, any of those radios you can also connect and tune the radio from them. Uh, GTN 650 will not. We've also added a uh, icon. Right now we're on uh, Aurora KUAO. Notice it's VFR. We've actually added the weather um, flag to the radio icon so you can see as soon as you go there. Pretty much any place we try to show a airport, we try to show the airport symbol and the weather if we have it. So this is the AOA. One of the big things we've just added is we have uh, added AOA tone. So just like the Dynon Skyview, you get a progressive beeping tone. Um, it's solid, 15% above stall. And you can select whether you want tones only, traditional voice alerts only, or both. So it'll give you tones and as soon as you get near stall, it'll say angle, angle push. And that's all configurable now. So. You can also select where you want the tones to begin and uh, the volume level of the tones. Do we have any other configuration that can or Sean? I think that's it. Um, we go to calibration here and go to a angle of attack and you can, here I can play the, here's the alert tone. change the volume there and then you can also change which tone it is I'm gonna play it again okay. 
And we have a new video that shows that it's about to come out. So, um, one thing we do differently is the AOA system in the AF5000 actually has two databases for flaps up or flaps down. In this picture, you can see the AOA display, the black circle in the middle means the flaps are up. Um, lining the bars up with the circle is best approach. Um, if you put the flaps down, you change the airfoil. Uh, you really should need two different databases for the AOA and it does that. So as soon as the flaps go down, that black donut will turn green. And as soon as you're lined up with the green donut, that's where you get the slowest tone. At the same time when we did that, we actually added verbal uh, audio voice alerts for flaps over speed and V and E. So now if you get going too fast, it immediately says over speed or it'll say flaps over speed if you get the flaps down above VFE. So one of the things we did on version 16 is we wanted to get away, we wanted the map display to be active all the time in pan mode. So you could select airspaces, airports, without having to touch the plane to go into pan mode. Um, once we did that, we had a, pop, a pretty popular feature where you could use a single finger swipe to swipe off the engine, the map. We had to get rid of that. So what we have done is gone to two finger swipe. So if you use two fingers and swipe the screen, you can swipe the map on, the engine on. At the same time, we came up with this new, I'm gonna back up, there's a display button in the middle lower buttons that says DISP. If you press that, we've always had it. It was one of those features nobody ever used because it was kind of confusing. Now when you press it, it brings up this menu. Those are large icons of how you want your display to look. So if you want an EFIS only, you touch the top left one. If you want a three-way split with EFIS, map, engine, you touch the right one, engine only. So it's much more intuitive, more convenient to switch screens. It's one button, or you can use two-finger swipe now. This is really especially important for people with single screens. Uh, a lot of times, like Rob's plane has three, three screens in it, so he does very little switching of screens. But if you have a single screen and you're trying to deal with maps and, and different phases of flight, this is, gives you a quick way to go between stuff, between primary displays. We also did it for a test to see who reads our uh, software install notes on the beta test. That's right. We sent it out and the very first thing was, swipe mode is now two fingers. It's amazing how many phone calls we got with, we broke the swipe mode. So, <laughs> um, so once we've done that, this is what our new map screen looks like. Um, it's live all the time. So you can pan, you can touch and like the parachute areas, if you touch them, it pops up. You can touch airports and get METAR data. Um, at the same time, we needed a mechanism to actually switch from a map to a sectional to an IFR to an approach plate. That is where this new icon in the upper right hand corner, which we call the hamburger icon. That if you touch the screen at all, it looks exactly like that. It fades over time, so it doesn't block part of the screen, but it's always visible slightly. Touching that screen brings up this page now. And these are large buttons where you can select standard map, a sectional, an IFR high, an IFR low, the airport diagram, or the approach plate. So those icons kind of used to be over the top of our map. Now they're actually in a clean menu that comes up. We've also greatly improved the flight planning predictability on which approach plate and airport diagram you want. So if you're going to multiple airports and you're out doing multiple approaches, it should keep track and bring up the correct approach plate for every leg. So let's say you're flying along and you wanna bring up Aurora, a different airport that's not in your flight plan. So what you would do in that case is hold the, change the airport by pushing and holding the airport diagram button. That selects airport. Then you can type in a new airport and the approach plates follow it. At the same time, you may notice um, on this map screen, we have changed the look of the icons for traffic. That traffic right now, you can see which direction he's going. Um, he's 300 feet above us. We have decided to change to the actual um, FAA standard icon. So now it matches 
for flight and most other systems are their standard icons for traffic. Uh, another feature that not many people know about is you can actually change how you want the airplane icon to look on the map. So this is actually the AOPA RV10. So you can edit it with a bitmap editor. Uh, it's a PNG file, load your own airplane. We've had lots of people do that. Yeah, the default weight and balance setup it picks a, a stock photo for you, but you, then you can change it to your own airplane. The people that have been beta testing the new map seem to like it much better. Um, the fonts on all the airports also, we changed that. So they've got more black background, they're larger, they're easier to read and see. We get a lot of questions. You've noticed down here in the traffic icon, I might as well talk about that. The traffic, where it says traffic ADSB one, that means there's one airplane within range, and that's that 300 feet above us. And notice the green okay. The, it'll either say no radar or it'll be okay. If you are actually in an area of ADSB coverage and the FAA's ADSB system is picking up your airplane and sending us back the traffic for your aircraft, that will be green and okay, signifying that you're in the system. No radar means you're an area of no radar. You'll still get traffic because our dual band receiver will pick up any airplane that has ADSB out directly. Are there any questions on that? Um, one of the big improvements we did too is we've gone to higher resolution sectionals, IFR low, IFR high charts. And that's a, this is an actual screen capture from my plane last night. It, um, it now uses the same chart format as the Dynon Skyview and HDX. So they're higher resolution and this is all the data from Seattle Avionics. We also draw weather overlay on top of the sectionals and in route charts as well. Yeah, so the airports, the airport flags and Nextrad draw on top of that now. Yeah. Where in the past it didn't do that. I don't know if I have any weather. Oh yeah, I have some weather over here. Here, if you look at my screen, you can kind of see some uh, weather overlay. This is XM weather currently. So you can see the weather overlay. You could still read everything. It's transparent, but gives you an idea what what you're seeing here. If you look at the map, the same area. Yeah. One of the biggest reasons for changing the traffic was on uh, sectionals and approach plates, which this is one of our geo-referenced approach plates. Traffic was really hard to see in the old colors. So now with the new teal traffic colors, they stand out much better on approach plates. So there's a lot of different traffic. Notice it's got the end numbers, um, clear to see. Uh, if you notice Salem, where the N1416 echo is, left of that is a little picture of a blue tower. We actually draw on the map where the ADSB towers are. There's, so there's an ADSB tower in Salem, we draw that. We're picking up two traffic targets because it shows that, and we are in compliance because we have a green okay. Uh, the flight planning on the AF5000 matches the Avidyne exact uh, look and feel and colors. So they work together really well. So your current leg, which we're on right now is magenta. Notice at Dubney, that's our next leg. It's candy striped, magenta and white. And the following leg is actually white. And then the missed approach procedures are gray. So if you looked on your Avidyne 550 or 540, or 440, it's going to look exactly like it, same color, same flight plan. So you get used to one, one way it looks. CO, uh, we've come, we actually came up with a new page for the CO detect, uh, any CO detector, and there's multiple sources. So if you have a Guardian Avionics CO detector, there's now a page. Um, 
it'll show you this gauge with carbon monoxide. It gives us density altitude. It gives us uh, cabin air temp. It's hot. I think it's mounted under the panel in this case. And cabin altitude. So that actually comes from a CO Guardian. If you, um, this one, it also is a pulse oximeter. So if you put your finger in it, it'll actually display your heart rate and your O2 level. At the same time, Ether, I'm pronouncing it right, this is their page. Now they've got a new system out that's got a lot of features that will also, uh, you can hook it to your tank pressure and will actually display tank pressure, carbon monoxide, same kind of data. And uh, they also have an SpO2 uh, and pulse rate on their new sensor that goes under their headset. Is it multiple people? I couldn't tell you right now. I don't know off the top of my head. I've got one sitting on my desk here. I'm, but. I believe it's multiple people, but yeah, so it'll actually list it on here. So we support that. Um, so CO Guardian or Ether, both of them work with it. Uh, analog or RS-232 on the Ether, I think. Correct. And it's on the check cabin page. So notice we've hit the checklist. We've hit check and panned over to the cabin tab. If it does bring up a warning or if you check your car, uh, your CO level or your O2 level, it'll pop up on the screen in the warning bar. So this is what uh, the warning bar is showing here. So O2 level 84, that seems low. Heart rate 126, I don't know who that was. I think that was somebody flying with me the other night. Upper left-hand corner, as um, long as we're here, ADSB weather, so regional and CONUS. So this is ADSB weather. The regional is high resolution next rad within 250 miles. So it's telling you that it's one minute old. CONUS is continental US. That's the whole country. It's not as, it's high, uh, lower resolution. And that weather is five minutes old in this picture. We've also added a nearest weather tab. So if you do nearest airports or nearest weather, it'll actually bring up a list of all the airports reporting weather and you can see each one. And right now you can see Tillamook is reporting marginal VFR, the rest are VFR. Um, I think the code down at Newport, ONP, means it's, re it's not reporting weather, but it has weather. That's what has that it gray is. It has a TAF, a terminal area forecast. It doesn't actually have a METAR available. So if you ever see the gray symbol with little T inside, it means you have a TAF only. And you, yeah, the T, yeah. All right. And you can actually activate that, can't you, Ken? That's with the activate button. So if you yeah, any scroll one of down to hit Hillsboro and hit activate the autopilot will fly to Hillsboro. Yeah. And METAR, so this is the check about or the check weather page. Once you hit checklist, there's all these different choices, system, map, weather, GPS, transponder. The check WX page actually brings up all the information. It'll tell you how many METARs, how many terminal area forecasts, TFRs it's picking up. You can see how old each source is. Um, this is really good for diagnostics and saying if it's working. The ADSB weather message count at the bottom, the 1726 is actually the weather data coming in. So you can check that. And if you had um, XM, so you can see my plane has XM. It also has a status for XM at the same time. So it, receiver ID, which plan, the signal strength, whether it's connected. Selecting any airport, and you can do that with touch, you can do it with nearest, you can bring up the flight plan, um, has a METAR tab and a terminal area forecast tab where we decode the METAR. And this is all the METAR data, including the current conditions color coded. So right now it's overcast 6,000 feet. We've kind of cleaned up the logbook page. So, 
the AF 5000 actually keeps a log book of every flight you make. It keeps track of cross country and local. Um, that then exports to a USB stick and you can use a PC based logbook program and it fills it out. So once about once a month or thereabouts, I take the USB stick out of my plane, I stick it in my PC and I use logbook pro and it just imports and fills out my whole logbook. So that's a really handy feature and you can look at every single flight. Notice the first 10 or 15 are light or white. Um, that ones below that are gray. You can see where the last time I imported my logbook, which looks like it was June 25th. So you can see where from, and then if you scroll to each one, it'll give you more information on it, whether it was across country or more data there. Transponder page. Uh, you touch the transponder up in the upper left-hand corner or use the hard button on the side. This is where you can go in and change the transponder. Um, it's mostly the same as the old V15 software. We've kind of cleaned up some of the menuing. Um, we've made some big improvements in the flight planning. So the flight planning now looks more like the Avidine. You can insert between legs. Um, it, um, in this case, we're going to OR40. Now I've got another screen you can select the runway. So before it knew the, you had to actually go through and select the run or enter the runway. Now it brings up a drop down list of what the runways are. Once you select a runway, it'll actually draw a lead in arrow on the airport on the map and it'll do hits boxes with a glide slope for it. So once we select it here, I guess I didn't show that one. So OR40 has runway 1634 and it'll do a glide slope into it, the synthetic approach. Checklist page, notice it's on the check. When you hit check, lower right hand button, it brings this up. Um, our checklist page, actually every item is check, checkable. So I've gone through and every time you push it on the joystick, it turns green. It also tells you when you actually finish the checklist. Maintenance page, color coded based on time and this is all adjustable from your PC. Uh, It'll give you a warning when it's time to do the annual or an oil change, BLT batteries. It's just kind of a convenient place to keep all that stuff. Radio page, looks like we've got two screens of that. We already talked about that. Uh, this is our electronic circuit breaker page. So if you have our advanced control module, this is where you actually would go to see uh, which items are turned on. Anything with green is currently on, and it also displays how many amps it's currently drawing. So you can see taxi light is red. That means it actually tripped the circuit breaker and it brought up a warning. It said electrical, electrical taxi light. Uh, this is where you'd always also go to reset it. So there's a reset button down below. You would just highlight it and reset the breaker. Um, total current. So right now the total current the ACM is putting out is 35.4. So it's really handy for traditional circuit breakers. You can't actually tell what current is going. This you can actually see the total system and each circuit how much power it's being consumed. We any questions? Got a few on chat coming through. We're trying to answer them as they as they come through. Is there any we should? Uh, there was a question about uh, where your door inputs came from, the door left and right, and those are the, the digital inputs. So each screen has three digital inputs that you can configure. Um, there was a question about how to configure those. I'll go to my, my screen here. If you go to inputs, you have the option to change. So it shows you the status of the, all the inputs in my system. I have two screens hooked up, so that's EFIS 2 has these inputs and I can change the label or I could change the usage. We have you know, generic inputs, tank transfers, canopy flaps, gear down, um, pedo warning, install warning. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with it. Um, and basically they pop up like you see there for the door since he's on the ground, they're not an war alarm, but once the RPM picks up above 1500 RPM, you can turn on the alarms for that. And so you would actually get an audio alarm system um, check canopy latch, I believe it says. All right. 
So this is the new flight plan menu. You can see how just like the Avidyne, the insert bar is between Glara and JJet. You would just go to that line and hit insert. So it acts just like the Avidyne. So it's a more intuitive interface, more familiar, especially if you're using an Avidyne. We cannot push flight plans currently back to the Avidyne so that you would use it on internal flight plan. Hey Rob, there was a question about uh, if you, can you manually pull an electronic circuit breaker and from our yes. page, yes you can. Okay, back um, up, there yeah, you go. So we either check notice. electrical and you can just hit reset on any one of these. You hit off. Or off actually, yeah. yeah. So you hit off and we'll go ahead and show it as off. Like if I turned off my my aux here, it would show it as off. And then yeah. you could reset it when to turn it back on. Notice the status says pulled, and that means that um, you have physically yourself done that action. Yeah, on taxi light right now, yeah, zero amps. It would show you how many amps it tripped at too, instead of zero. Mm -hmm. And then the status, yeah, like you said, it said pulled, so. Weight and balance page, so looks like your airplane. We've just kind of done some cleanup in there. You can modify the stations now from the screen easily. Um, these are the inset windows. So that first page we kind of showed earlier, touching the center of the screen brings up the menu to change it. So in this case, we have a little mini map on the left side and a mini flight plan. Uh, touching the flight plan on the right hand side of it would bring up the large flight plan touching the waypoint would actually bring up information on the waypoint. So if you had a DS, an airport, it would bring up the airport page. And options there are G meter, traffic window, oh, profile view, it'll show you the heights of the mountains in a profile. If you have XM, uh, XM music, so you just bring up the Check music, I think it is. <laughs> what is it, Ken? <laughs> uh, check radio. Check radio brings up the radio. This is where you select which channel you want to listen to, how you set the volume. So that's a handy thing. All right, I think that is the slides. So why don't we open it up to questions or discussion or Ken's got the G meter on there, you can see that. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, you can either raise your hand or I'll even, um, let's see, we'll turn off the, uh, turn off the option you can unmute yourself if, if you'd like um, without even raising your hand if you just wanna hop in and ask a question of Rob or the advanced team. Or just say hi. Hey y'all, this is Tyler Russell. I just want to say thanks. This is a really good presentation to have. So um, it, it's good to have the live content during Oshkosh. So we're, we miss seeing you guys. Yeah. Yeah, we miss visiting with, uh, with all of you as well. It's like uh, Craig's got a question, Craig Fowler. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, I'm new to this, so I'm an experienced pilot, but help me out understand how the uh, databases with the difference between your IFR or your NAV database on board the EFIS versus the database on the IFR navigator. So the, the EFIS itself has two databases. The, um, the map, like on Ken's screen, is generated from our own database. And that is every 28 days we post it on our website and that is free data that has all the airspaces, the airports, the frequencies. That is the main map database then on the, and it's stored inside the unit. Um, the USB sticks contain Seattle avionics if you're in the US and the Seattle avionics data is the VFR sectionals, the IFR low high approach plates, airport diagrams, um, that all comes from Seattle Avionics. It's $99 a year. Um, one thing they have just with our new version 16, they have a new data loader at the same time. 
that goes to our website and gets our map database at the same time and puts it on the USB stick. So if you use their loader, it puts our map data on as well as their chart data all at the same time. So um, does there's also a database on the Avidine, your right. IFR navigator. So, I mean, it seems like you're duplicating it. Can't you just use an IFR position source that directs your database for IFR flight? Or? No, so that is not legal. And um, there's two problems. Um, our database does not actually have the approaches in it. So you can't select Aurora and select the RNAV 3.5 approach. Um, and since the Avidine is actually the legal, uh, the approach source, we're following it. So there's really no way to get around ha not having the Jeppesen database. Now, one thing you can do is there's no sense having the approach plates, which are expensive from Jeppesen. So what I normally do in my plane is just keep the nav data current in my Avidine and use approach plates on the EFIS. They, they're bigger, they look better, and you have to worry about it. So and it, it'll end up saving you money. Um, Jeppesen recently lowered the price pretty significantly on the NAV data for the Avidine. I think it's okay. three, $350 a year now. For you the know, database Mike? on the Avidine? Yeah, do you know, Mike? I think that's what it is. It, it would, used to be 500 and they've lowered it in the 300s. And does that cover the entire US or? Entire US. Yeah. And does an Avidine box hold the entire US database? Yeah, it'll ha actually hold the entire world database. When we ship them out, there's a worldwide database. You can pick any country and the approaches in it. <laughs> Pretty wild. All right, thank you. Sure. Hey, Rob, it's Mike. Uh huh. Um, your flap speed warning, uh, that sounds great. I. I sometimes do that do you, do you does it have a warning at the different settings like 10 degrees 20 degrees 30 degrees so that is a good story <laughs> i've been flying my rv10 for 11 years and i had always used different flap display speeds on um so in my mind i always thought you could go to 30 percent at 120 knots um, apparently that is not the case. Um, the 88 knots or 89, I have mine set at 90, is actually for all flap settings other than trail in the RV-10. So um, I had a discussion recently and was flying with some vans. People are like, uh, no, you can't put down 10% flaps at 120 knots. So um, we had so many people, uh, beta testers, scream that they were getting flap overspeed warnings though that we have added a new feature where you can actually set a percentage of where the warning starts. Isn't that right, Ken? Isn't it 50 yeah. or 40 or yeah? Yeah, you can set the percentage of what how far down in the speed. So if you're at that percentage you exceed that speed, you get the flap over speed. So you adjust it to the most conservative level for your airplane. And since that's up to you, we don't know that information. It's up to you to decide that. But yeah, technically, Vans only has a single VFE speed for all their airplanes. Okay, that answers my question. <laughs> Looks like there's a question from uh, Josh. Josh, if you want to unmute yourself. Hey, thanks. Just wanted to thank all the AFS guys and the Dynon guys. Um, I just got my panel installed about two months ago and worked with Rob and Ken especially through some issues, some of my own creation, some not, but um, everything's working great now. And if, um, if anyone wants to see an AFS panel in action, it happens to be in SoCal, uh, Rob knows how to find me. And I'd be happy to show you an airplane that actually has it and show you around it as well. I'm going to set Josh up to Josh from the time you got the panel. How long until you flew the plane? Are you muted? Josh. Um, we took our time completely. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, it was three weeks. Um, and that included really taking our time and taking weekends off. Um, you know, the install is, I mean, it can, it can be done by someone that's never done it before. I think you could probably do it if you're starting completely from scratch and 
10 days if you read up, uh, probably even a lot less if you, if you really wanted to and work long days. And yours was a flying airplane with an old panel. It was. So the three weeks included gutting, poorly wired panel, you know, um, just completely taking all the wiring out and, and starting fresh. Um, so uh, it, it was it was a process in that, but really it was, of the three weeks, it was probably almost two of those weeks were taken just undoing what was already done. Nice. Thanks. So while we still have, uh, it's like a 30 of you still on and uh, another 20 or so on Facebook, uh, let's do a little quick giveaway. This will be, uh, Rob, did you say it's uh, for an advanced jacket? Yeah, right? we're going to give away an advanced jacket. Yeah, so that's the, these are the same jackets that we uh, got ourselves for the air shows um, after years of not having any kind of uniform other than our polos. Uh, this, this jacket I'm wearing here is the, it's a North Face jacket. Where's the branding? Well. Oh. There you go. It's a North Face jacket. It's a nice uh, wind shell. Uh, yours would say uh, advanced flight systems if you advanced flight systems uh, if uh, if you won today. And the way we'll do this is uh, throw in a number, uh, type in a number, one per person, into the chat between one and a hundred. We'll spin a virtual wheel, and uh, then the person that's uh, closest, prices right rules, uh, without going over. Uh, wins the jacket. We'll give you a few uh, minutes to a few seconds to uh, get numbers in. We'll wait for uh, the for Facebook, which is running like ten seconds behind. And do they post numbers on Facebook too? Uh, yeah, I think I think some people do. Yeah, there's that. There's they're they're coming in right now. Yeah, so the Facebook feed runs like 10, 15 seconds behind. So there's numbers coming in. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna let's see, get my wheel of names going here. Just one second. And I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so let's see. Yeah, so the Facebook feed runs like 10, 15 seconds behind. So, all right. Numbers coming in. <laughs> the, all right. So, I'm going to, I mean, here we go. So, you get my wheel of names going here. Just one second. All right. The winning number is 43. So, the closest is 43 right. see. without going over. Let's see, do we have a 43? ML is 42. All right, so we got a 42. I'm going to check the, the Facebook feed. I'm seeing, uh, I think that's the winner. 42. And who was that there? I didn't win again. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll contact you privately here. And we need to know size. Congratulations. Ah. Yeah. That's It'll be going out today. <laughs> All right. I sent him uh, my contact info and I'll pass it along, Rob. Okay. Any other questions as we wrap up? Were there, I think there were a couple in the chat right before uh, we we killed the chat with numbers. Let's see. There's one. Uh, can you comment on whether the Avidine or 650 is more compatible? So uh, I have both in my RV10. I have a GTN 650 and I have an Avidine 550. Um, as far as uh, everyday use, putting the flight plan in, coming across, they both work exactly the same. The advantage to the Avidine, um, things that are more compatible, the, um, we will send weather and traffic from ADSB back to the Avidine and we can also tune the radio. So you can tune the Avidine so it acts just like a connected comm to the EFIS. 
Um, the other advantage I think to the Avidine is the flight plan colors look exactly the same as the AFS. And I think it's a true FMS. It's more intuitive and it has a keyboard. Um, I'm pretty fair about it. And I have a lot of people fly with me and I have them try both. Pretty much everybody likes the Avidine better than the GTN. Um, had another question. Can you set up a clean, dedicated corner box that would only show ADSB traffic? And yes. that would be yes with the inset window, right? Yep. If you look at my screen, I've got an inset window. I don't have a traffic source because I don't have an ADSB box connected to my screens right now. But let's say you did, it would show traffic there with the same symbology that you saw in, in the other slides. And the traffic also has um, audio alerts. So really, it... Um, if you get traffic close to you or it's a threat, it, you will hear it in the headsets. So yes, it's nice to have it. And we also draw it in um, on the EFIS display. It shows how far away it is. There's a number in the middle of the traffic target. So you can tell if it's one mile away or it's within nine miles we draw the, the number. Yes, James has a question. I think. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, you, you guys go. muted me earlier. Um, how would this compare to Garmin and when does this version go live? Um, there's probably 35 people flying it now. Um, and we, we're, we're ready to go live, we think now. Um, Seattle Avionics is working on their software update and there's been some delay there. So we're trying not to overrun them with everybody switching to their new version. So we'd like to see their production version done. And they told us that's within a week. Wow. So I think we're imminent. Um, it, we can send it to anybody. If you'd send me an email, rob at advanced-flight-systems, we can send you 16 now. Are you gonna, are you gonna be in on Tuesday? I was I'm going, going stop on vacation by, uh, next week. Oh, you are. <laughs> okay. And if anybody deserves a vacation, it's Rob. He's been working hard lately. <laughs> so I will be gone. Um, other people will be here, though. Okay. But um, every screen's different. Um, there's advantages to all of them. Um, one thing about the AF5000, it's a 4-3 ratio screen. Um, so there's a lot of screen area compared to other 10 inch screens. Um, we still have a joystick. There's three knobs and more buttons. So I think as far as how intuitive it is, um, if, if you're flying along and ATC tells you to fly heading 230 and go to 8,000 feet, you can use the knob to adjust it or you can literally hit heading type 230 out type 8,000 enter with hard buttons or touch. And so I think Usability, there's some real advantages to it. Um, there's 21 buttons on it and a touch screen. We try to make, try really hard to, the, to use both the touch screen and the hard thing and have redundant input operations. So if it's bumpy, you can use the hard buttons. If it's not so bumpy, you can, some things make more sense to use the touch screen than the hard buttons do. But sometimes there's no nothing beating a knob. So it's kind of the, try to give you the best option that works for you. The, um, the Avidine's kind of the same way. It has lots of buttons, but the GTN is all touch pretty much. Uh, there's a question from Michael Hunter. What are the big differences between advanced and the HDX screens? He's building an RV8 and, and on and planning on eventually making it IFR? Um, kind of personal preference. You ought to come try both. Um, you know, a different uh, HDX is a wide format screen um, where the AFS is 4.3. They, they run the same processor, same memory, same speed. The um, software is different. Um, so that's the, some of the differences are, um, if you ever want XM, the AFS supports XM. Um, but the a thing lot I of the features are the same. I mean. Yeah, I think the thing 
most people would notice as a customer is obviously the form factors are different. The, um, the advanced screens are the are the four three, the more square form factor. The advanced or the, the Dynon sky views are wider. And then you know we grew up as competitors, so we were kind of implementing a lot of the same features uh, in parallel, but doing them with different you know sensibilities and different styles, frankly. So the user interfaces are are um, uh, quite a bit different, but both super intuitive and usable. If um, the the AFS does send ADSB traffic to the Avidyne, and the flight planning looks the same color, same look as the Avidyne. So for IFR, you know, you're used to how it looks on the Avidyne, it looks the same on the AFS. And Michael's additional question here is he's in the UK, it's quite hard to see them. Can it visit you if and when the US air links are open again? Yes. yes. We're, right, we're five miles from Vans. Um, Vans sends lots of people over and I take lots of people flying in my RV-10, so. Sounds like an invitation to me. Yeah. And, and Rob does have, I think you still have both systems in, in your airplane, is that right? Uh, today I don't because we're doing some <laughs> videoing, we're testing, gotcha. but gotcha. usually I have HDX and AFS in my plane. It, my right screen is set up, we can swap them back and forth. Gotcha. That's a off-label use for the, for the record. You, you, can't, you can't mix and match the displays in your system as a customer. It's not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not officially software supported. Not even close. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like the questions are tapering off. Um, in an hour at four o'clock, we have another session that's about advanced panel, which is building either the AF5000 or Skyview uh, screens into a complete ready to go turnkey plug and play awesome uh, panel. That'll save you tons of time on the install. So if you wanna learn about that, uh, come back in an hour. It's a different Zoom link. Uh, so get that from our website, or if you signed up, it, you'll get the email, you should have the email reminder right about now. And then tomorrow, um, similar to this, it, but on Skyview HDX. And on Saturday, the uh, virtual hangar happy hour, um, which won't be as programmed, but um, we'll just talk avionics, airplanes, whatever you wanna talk about. So thanks everyone for coming today and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone.